I see people are starting to log in. So we're just going to wait till the start time and just a little bit after that before we get going. Okay, for those just joining in, I'll just do a few introductions just uh, while we're waiting and I'll reintroduce everybody. Um, I'm Adrian Mason, I'm Managing Editor of Hackai Magazine and um, so happy to organize this webinar. Um, we have writer Christina Couch uh, who brought this story to us, uh, Monique Coombs from the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and Ian McPherson from the Prince Edward Island Marine Fish or Fish um, Fishermen's Association. So just gonna give it another couple of minutes and then I'll reintroduce and we'll get going. <laughs> so you're in the right place if you've come to the uh, webinar on mental health in the fishing community. Okay, well, I'm going to just get going because people, um, there's still some trickling in, but we're, uh, we're just, just a minute or two after our start time. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Adrian Mason and I'm one of the managing editors at Hakai Magazine. We're based in Victoria, British Columbia, and we uh, write about stories from coastal environments all around the world. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this very important discussion about uh, mental health in fishing communities. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the great discussion ahead. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar is about 45 minutes long, um, but uh, I encourage anyone if who has a question to start sending them in now. There's the chat function at the bottom. You can just post your questions in there. Um, we have a team monitoring the questions and feeding them to me. So I'll occasionally look away from the screen uh, camera, but I'm actually just looking at uh, questions and other feedback. So I'm not uh, just checking my email or tuning out. So, <laughs> um, so um, yeah. I think that's the main housekeeping things. We we probably will save most of the questions to the end, but I may try to um, intersperse them if they're relevant to the discussion at hand. Uh, also, we won't be, um, we'll just say the questions, we won't be tagging a person or a place to it unless it's very specific uh, to the question. So they're essentially anonymous when I read them out. Uh, so feel don't feel filtered by that. Okay, so I think we'll we'll get going. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Christina Couch, who was the, the writer of this story that we published last week in the magazine. Uh, we were really pleased when uh, Christina came to us with this story. Um, mental health and fishing community is something we had wanted to cover. We were seeing uh, certainly some news here and there about it, knew it was something that needed to be talked about. And we're seeing some papers as, as well in journals. So we just were writing, waiting for the right story and Christina came, came along. So it was perfect. Um, Christina is a freelance writer and she it works in the graduate program uh, in science writing at MIT. I think I have that correct. Okay. Uh, we also have Monique Coombs, who is Director of Community Programs at the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and Ian McPherson, who is Executive Director of the Prince Edward Island Fishermen's Association. So it's really great we have representation from Canada and the United States organizations working in the realm of mental health in fisheries. And also in the story, if you've read it, uh, we have a third um, organization mentioned that's based in the United Kingdom. So, um, uh, and I wanted to note actually on that point, we have put the links to these organizations as well as a few others at the bottom of the article uh, in the magazine 
magazine on the magazine website so and hopefully we can add more if there are some that exist out there similar organizations around the world in case anybody comes looking so that's also something to contribute if you know of other organizations doing similar work all right so let's get going uh, Christina, I wanted to just chat with you first. Can you tell us how you became interested in this story and what you found most surprising as you got into it? Yeah, so I stumbled across a press release from the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, not this past February, but the one before. So a lot, this story took a really long time to report out. And at the time, um, Monique's group had just won a grant um, to uh, bolster mental health awareness um, among commercial fishermen. And I stumbled across this like little teeny press release. And I was really interested in that because I was aware of um, the statistics on how dangerous commercial fishing can be and, uh, you know, some of the trauma that can kind of go into working in that job. But I'd never heard of any sort of support program um, for mental health. And so I write about mental health a good bit in various contexts. Um, so I was really interested to see this unique program springing up. Um, it is also really rare to see a mental health program that's aimed at, um, at like working America. A lot of times mental health is um, sort of framed as this thing that's, that's like for a specific group of people and it is absolutely not. And so I really enjoy covering um, mental health initiatives that are aimed at that are accessible and inclusive. Um, so I found it, uh, I reached out to Monique and originally when I was reporting the story, I really thought it would be a piece on PTSD, on trauma, um, on kind of the dangers of the job. And then as it sort of started panning out, the more I interviewed people, the more I realized like that is some piece of it, but that most of, the, I, universally the fishermen I interviewed considered the job to be pretty safe. Um, and that the harder, more stressy part was sort of um, increasing regulation and not having a direct tie to the science that's driving fishing regulation and feeling financially strangled over years and years and years and years. Um, one of the big takeaways that I had was that uh, telling a, a, a much slower story about how regulation can really impact a community and squeeze them and add pressure um, is just as personal as talking about like a big traumatic event. Um, and so that was sort of my journey through the story. Great, thanks, uh, uh, Christina. That was also very surprising to me. And I think it probably was for a lot of um, people reading the story. You, you think again, danger and isolation and things, but it's this slow, uh, drip of other things that are happening. So I know uh, our panelists will talk about that. Just before we move on, I made a mistake. You don't put your questions in the chat. You put it in the Q&A, which is also in the bottom there. Uh, it's probably apparent to most of you, but I screwed up. So sorry about that. Um, all right. So uh, I think we'll move on here. Monique, um, I'd like you to describe your organization and how it was formed and then how you became to um, started to um, address mental health issues in the fishing community. Sure, sure, thank you. So yeah, I work for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Our office is located in Brunswick, Maine, which is part of Midcoast, Maine. Um, I'm actually talking with all of you today from Oars Island, um, which is a part of Harpswell, Maine. It's just a few minutes north of Brunswick. And if you're familiar with Maine, it's about 45 minutes north of uh, Portland. Um, our organization was founded in 2006 by fish fishermen um, out of a community called Port Clyde, which is about two hours north of me, also along the coast. That's when you start to get into down east Maine. Uh, the fishermen started the organizations because um, they're considered, these guys in Port Clyde were considered sort of smaller boat fishermen working in the ground fish industry, which is in species like cod, pollock, hake, halibut, those types of things. Um, and they just wanted to have a stronger voice um, in policy and regulations. And so that's that's sort of where the organization started. It was actually initially called the Mid Coast Fishermen's Association. Um, 2010 is when it became the Main Coast Fishermen's Association and started to work on policy as well as other advocacy and issues. Uh, our mission, just I should have said before, is to restore the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's fishing communities for future generations. 
So like I said, we work on a lot of uh, policy issues, advocacy issues, uh, regulations. Um, my job as the director of community programs is um, I say I, I work on the stuff that's sort of um, on land and the, some of the social aspects with fishermen, you know, whether it pertains to seafood or um, community programs, like some of this mental health stuff, which came out of some work that I did um, actually about the working waterfront on the coast of Maine. So a few years ago, uh, gosh, I believe it was about 2018, 2019, I conducted a report on the, the working waterfront along the coast and whether or not we were losing access and what some of the issues were. And I found that in every single one of my interviews with fishermen, they mentioned some sort of fatigue, stress, helplessness, lack of control, um, you know, and those types of things. And what I initially thought might have been a, you know, super exciting project to be running up and down the coast and talking with fishermen became incredibly difficult um, because they could see firsthand some of the mental health and well-being uh, issues that they were dealing with, as, as well as my own mental health sort of going up and down um, through these interviews. And so we decided to, to just look into a little bit more what would mental health programs look like for fishermen. And, you know, we were kind of bummed that we didn't find as many um, programs or resources available for fishermen in the United States um, as we might have liked. And so we started to uh, embark on this and it's been growing slowly but surely over the past couple of years, which I can get into um, a little bit more later. But as Christina said, you know, fishing is is dangerous and there are a lot of um, PTSD and, and stress that goes along with it. But I also, I sort of describe it as fishermen living with a uh, perpetual job insecurity. Um, they, they never know, you know, one day from the next. And so uh, that's sort of how I, I got into it. Great, thank you, Christina. Uh, Ian, could you tell us about your organization? Uh, sure, we're uh, we're a little older. Uh, roots of the organization are back in the 1950s, and there was uh, six. There's been uh, six local groups for quite some time, but um, uh, between the 50s and the uh, 1980s, uh, then an umbrella organization, the PEI Fishermen's Association, was formed, and and so we do many of the same things that uh, Monique's uh, organization does. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, full-time science people on staff, two people. And so we're involved with some research also, but uh, yeah, certainly, I mean, governments like to deal with uh, org organizations that represent a number of people. So that's, that's our background. Um, in terms of species, um, uh, lobster is the big one, uh, some ground fish, herring, mackerel, a uh, little bit of bluefin tuna. But um, when you start to talk about the stress, because we're so dependent, we didn't, weren't always as dependent, but it, you know, gets into that discussion about management of the resource and, and maybe the harvesters not having the input that they should. But uh, so we're pretty dependent on lobster, but um, we were very fortunate. We're in a building with a, a number of uh, other nonprofits and a colleague down the way that's uh, my, was my counterpart with the agriculture, one of the agricultural organizations. Uh, they had this program in place, I believe, uh, at least five years. And um, so we were able to uh, adapt that program and, and, and make it work for the fishery. Uh, I guess what's interesting is that, I, I, I don't know in the US, but one of the challenges we find here is people kind of forget about the fishery when they're talking about food production. And one of the things that uh, I find is there's a lot of support programs and not that they're not deserved on the agricultural side, but they're just not offered to the fishing communities. So uh, that's one of the primary things and a program like this is a good start because let's face it in your agriculture or fisheries, generally you're uh, coastal based or in a small community and have a lot of the same challenges. So that's the position we're coming from, thanks. Great, thank you. And Monique, you mentioned that I think, or maybe Christina brought it up, that there are equivalent programs for agriculture uh, that are fairly well established in the states as well, but no equivalent for fishers, yeah, fisheries. 
Yeah, the, the US uh, Department of Agriculture offers quite a few programs um, for, for farmers and new farmers, um, both around just substance abuse and depression, um, suicide prevention. Um, and, and one thing Ian kind of mentioned this too, that that get that happens is not only does sort of fisheries and seafood sort of, I don't wanna say end up at the bottom of the pile, cause I don't mean to demean it, but um, our industry and the way that we talk about it is often very dehumanized. And so where we're talking about, you know, say in the US, um, we're having issues um, around dairy or something. And there's an article about dairy. There's often something that goes back to the story of the, fall, the, the family farm behind those dairy issues and what's happening for those farmers to support them through whatever challenge they're facing. And that doesn't necessarily happen for us around fishing very often. We'll report on what's wrong with the boat or what's wrong with the gear or what's wrong with the policy without telling that same story or narrative about the fishermen themselves. And that becomes a lot of that becomes like a language issue too, which I'm going to go ahead. I saw in, in the in the q and I don't know if it's cheating that I looked, but I, I did see that someone asked about the word fisherman. And I'm actually I, I had made a note to myself. No, I was going to say, right let's just get it out of the way. So go let's ahead. Get it out of the way. And we have thought was, about this, for, uh, reader. I know, and it, it's, it's fishers and fishermen. Um, we also have watermen in America. Um, in, in Maine specifically, and, and in actually many other coastal um, states, as well as some in Alaska, although they do tend to say fishers more in Alaska, um, women have also self-selected the term fishermen as what we prefer to be described. Um, oftentimes you'll read academic reports and stuff in the United States and they will stay, still say fishers. But when we're talking of, um, you know, in our community and the vernacular that we use um, within the industry, fishermen is all encompassing of both men and women and you know for for better or for worse um as an english major I, I look at the language that we use to talk about the fishing industry a lot and how it can be rather negative and extractive um and i think that that also plays um a role in considering and talking about mental health in our industry because again if we're constantly talking about the gear and the boats and the ocean as we should be and neglecting to talk about the fishermen and or the fishers and their roles in this process, sometimes that's um, not very empowering and can often be demeaning. And, and, you know, for me, I think bringing the mental health conversation to this industry in such a way will help to humanize the fishermen um, and maybe help some people see that seafood absolutely should be a larger part of our food system. Um, because for communities like mine in Ors Island, the, the fishermen are incredibly valuable to um, our economy as, as well as our, our culture. Yes, thank you for addressing that. I was, I thought we better do it because I, I don't want people to be thinking for that very reason that you just said, focused on that. Uh, just for the record, um, we let the writer decide based on the story and we've also done a story about this very question in the magazine it's called fishers or fishermen which is right and generally it pretty much echoed what uh, monique just said uh academics and others uh will say fishers and and but generally the fisher the people who fish even if they're women tend to prefer fishermen. So we're, we um, totally acknowledge that uh, language is very important, but we have thought about this a lot. And I knew that I was actually kind of glad that the question came up because we, I know Christina and Monique talked about it specifically. So yeah, great. Yeah, we originally Thanks. had Fisher in the story and then Monique was like, let me, <laughs> let me step in here. Yeah, great. All right, thank you. Um, all right. So um, let's talk, uh, Christina, let's talk a little bit. We'll start with you and then we'll, and, and it's been touched on a bit, is this whole idea of, um, you know, we talked about things like uh, the slow drip of regulations and all this stuff changing and people having to change their gear and licensing and all this to, to adjust. But one of the things that you also said that the Fishers expressed frustration of is that these regulations were kind of made with research and government, but not with the fishermen. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that and then we'll let Ian and um, Monique weigh in. Yeah, so one thing that I heard repeatedly from the fisherman side and also from the research side is that those two worlds are often very separate. And so uh, 
fishermen will be subjugated to regulation that is based on science that they were not a part of and oftentimes does not align with what they have seen. So one of the um, sort of controversies going on right now in the Brunswick main area of the country is that you have a lot of fishermen that are reporting that cod exists in the area, whereas the cod fishery shut down in 1948 there. So there's that sort of discrepancy. Um, many of the people that I interviewed said that this was changing and that this was like a thing that was getting better, but historically has not been the case. And so you still have a lot of regulation that does not reflect what fishermen are seeing. Um, I do believe that there is more of an effort to um, to combine those worlds and to have fishermen be a stakeholder within um, doing that type of environmental research. However, this is another area where regulation gets in the way because you have to have things like uh, one of the fishermen I interviewed said that he would love to participate in these studies, but doing so would require him to outfit his boat with like a working toilet, which he and his crew have not had since uh, they started. And so it still requires like a, a good amount of investment capital, even for a fisherman to participate in some of these studies sometimes. So my sense is that um, what sources have told me is that this landscape is changing, that the research realm is making much more of an effort to sort of connect with um, fishermen, but that it's still an issue. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Ian, did you wanna add to that or weigh in? Uh, well, I, I think um, sometimes uh, as an industry or on the harvesting side, we're kind of our own worst enemy or have been in the past. But um, we had a very galvanizing event uh, on the East Coast here a couple of years ago where uh, pulp mill was proposing something that uh, was not uh, popular with the fishing community. And so what's come from that is we've learned to work together with other fishing organizations a, a lot better. And uh, so uh, I, I guess we're a little better at pushing back at some of these regulatory changes. I think that was a great piece for Christina to uh, identify that it's probably a bigger factor in, in uh, people being uh, unsettled and, and, and stress issues and things like that than we, we think of. And, and, you know, the problem is, and in, in Canada here, I mean, uh, other than the Ottawa River, uh, you know, all the bureaucrats that make these policies and decisions are, are uh, thousands of kilometers away or a significant uh, distance away and don't get to the coastal communities. So uh, we've been pretty hard on saying, hey, we got to be part of the decision making process because it's not working. They'll spend a lot of time and effort, launch a policy and then wonder why they get uh, pushback. And I believe uh, Monique uh, mentioned a little earlier about some perceptions and and the community does not push back on everything but i'll tell you fishers are not happy about things that don't make either economic sense or practical sense on the boat and and so we're getting more organized to uh keep on it and and keep advocating until things that make sense uh get adopted great thanks monique yeah, what Ian said. <laughs> um, it's very similar here. You know, sometimes the people that are making the decisions about policy and regulation, regulation changes don't have any experience on the water. Um, I think one thing that fishermen are absolutely experts in is, is being on the ocean. They have so much experience and hours out there. They understand how little control they have, how things can change quickly. Um, it's unpredictable. And um, so they want to be part of these conversations um, that will, will change not just their industry and their business, but has the potential to change their way of life and impact the ocean in some capacity. Um, and I think again, you know, with the, this mental health conversation, it's not just about making space for them at the table, which is um, sort of where we're at in the United States with things as, as fishermen are now being asked to be at the table, which we're absolutely elated about. But what we're finding is um, it feels more like a check in the box than it does actual change. Um, and so for us, what we're demanding um, here in Maine specifically as well, and, and other states too, is thank you for inviting us to the table. Could you please work with us to help us understand, one, how to engage in the conversation in a meaningful way, but how our information is going to help impact any change or policy for the better, of course. Um, and so, so that's kind of where we're at with those things. 
one thing I wanted to add, if it's okay, um, is the fishermen that I spoke with were very clear that uh, that there's been this portrayal of environmentalists versus fishermen and that that's not, everybody is sort of on the same team here. Um, the fishermen that I spoke to, uh, one of the major environmental issues going on in Maine is protection of North Atlantic right whales. And the fishermen I spoke to were just universally like, absolutely let's preserve the biodiversity and ecology of this area. They were very specific that they just wanted to be a part of that conversation, but that they overall absolutely agreed with, um, with the need to preserve and to take environmental action. Great. All right. Um, I think we, we kind of touched on this. I just have, I, 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 is there any more specifics about uh, Ian um, and Monique, how regulatory bodies could better support fishers or did, was that, do you feel like it was pretty much, we've covered that well enough? Well, I, I, I think it, it takes dialogue and to have a mutual respect that years on the water is, is the equivalency or more than a, a graduate degree in science. And, and we need the science, we need everybody working together, but, um, and we've come a long way with our uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, but uh, certainly we, I've been to numerous meetings where, uh, guess what gang, we're the smartest in the room and, and, and we know this and, uh, and, and that can cause problems down the way if all stakeholders uh, don't have a fair and equitable say in what's going on. Yeah, and I'll just add, I'm, I'm going to keep going with my, my theme or um, uh, just a, around language. And, and that is, as Christina mentioned, um, especially Maine lobstermen are deeply concerned about the future of the Gulf of Maine, as well as all of the species and the marine resources that are there. And what I found is, you know, sometimes the scientists, the policymakers and the fishermen are saying very similar things. They're just saying it very differently. And so I think um, communication and um, some of that connection from human to human, you know, can, can benefit both the fishermen as, as well as our marine resources in the ocean, but we have to allow that to happen. And I, again, like I, I think mental health and, and talking about um, supporting fishermen while all these things are happening, but supporting them as humans with families that um, are concerned about their businesses. And as I mentioned, I've, I've started sort of thinking about it in, in regards to fishermen living with um, perpetual job insecurity. So if they, if they don't have control of the regulations or the policy, if they are also having to adapt because of climate change impacts and warming waters and sea level rise, um, if they're having to, you know, as Ian mentioned, um, you know, deal with different types of development and spatial marine use in the waters and, and having to share the waters differently. Um, if they're having to deal with the rising costs of bait and fuel while their prices for their catch is, is diminishing. Um, you know, these are all things that cumulatively, or even on their own are sometimes, you know, stress inducing, but cumulatively, you know, if you're consistently worried about your, your job, that's, I mean, there's plenty of data about, about, you know, the impacts of job insecurity on someone's mental health for just two weeks. So imagine for some of these fishermen, you know, that have been fishing 10, 20, 30 years, and they're seeing over time that their role in their industry, as opposed to being, you know, considered more important and increasing in the policy and regulation realm is actually decreasing, that, that's gonna hurt their mental health. And it, it also, it feels like you don't have any control over your business, um, which is a bummer because, and I'm, I'm sure Ian would say the same, you know, fishermen are, are incredibly intelligent, um, especially when it comes to the ocean. And they are incredibly practical. Uh, and, you know, like he said, if it's not economically feasible or practical, that, that's information that people should be listening to um, in some way, shape, or form. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I think there's probably a mismatch in timing. You know, the, the fishermen are seeing things in real time. They're seeing these, you know, changes year after year. They're on the water, whereas regulations and policy, although sometimes they seem to happen fast and out of the blue, um, 
can be slow. So there's all this this mismatch there. Yeah, absolutely. Can I add to that too? Then sure. so. One of the things too that's um, interesting to think about, and I'd be interested to hear sort of Ian's thoughts on this too, is um, you know fish are going to have to adapt to the changes in the ocean and in the in the the fish stock assessments and what have you, um, regardless of whether or not they had any part in that. So often we hear that you know overfishing is the cause of like a, a species decline, but we don't talk about pesticide use. We don't talk about people letting go of balloons. We don't talk about people, you know, driving cars and opening and closing doors with the air conditioners on and that we're all incredibly responsible for the health of the ocean. And so very much, um, you know, the fishermen care deeply about the ocean. They often end up being the ones that are paying the penance for things that we're all responsible for. Um, and and that's, that's tough too, right? So I, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks. We had a, a letter that came in, and which I thought this phrasing, it sort of gets at what you're talking about. There's a, it was from a fisherman and just said that he was passing it on, explaining to people that this is the backstory behind the fish, the, 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 uh, the seafood. There's this whole other realm of stuff going on that brings this food, um, food to us and we seem to cherish that seafood so there's you know these are things we need to think about all right we're getting a few questions so I thought maybe um, we can um, shift into those a little bit um, uh, Ian maybe start with you or if anybody knows are there any recovery groups specifically just for commercial fishermen and it doesn't specify the country or uh, recovery meaning a support program? Th they say recovery, but I assume something like that. Yeah. Yes, um, yes we have a, a, we modified the, the program that agriculture had, but it's uh, a lot of it was transferable, but we did uh, get some important changes. Uh, one of the key ones being is initially uh, the program was just directed at the captains. And, and most of our, we represent about 1300 captains and, and most boats have at least three people, including the captain in the, in the boat. And so uh, our group uh, took the initiative to also expand the program uh, to crew, crew members. So, uh, and I think I might've mentioned something to Christine in the article that, you know, if your crew people don't have their focus on their job, I mean, that's dangerous to everyone and uh, you don't wanna have people hurt. You, you wanna, it takes their entire focus to be on the boat. And uh, so we're very pleased and actually some of our statistics have jumped up uh, quite significantly in terms of use of the program since we, we uh, made that public. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what kind of, what happens in the programs? Like what kind of services are offered? Uh, oh, uh, sure. Uh, basically uh, there's a, a toll free number to counselors that are located here on Prince Edward Island. And I'll just be quick, but um, stress and anxiety, alcohol, drug misuse, bereavement, uh, marital issues, depression, elder care. Uh, you know, a lot of these are other parts of society too, but family matters, uh, counseling with kids, um, legal, financial, learning disabilities, grief, career counseling and anger management. I mean, it's a pretty comprehensive list. Uh, it's a totally confidential. We just get some aggregate statistics every uh, twice a year. And uh, basically it's meant for front frontline services. So uh, a person would call in, uh, those counselors might have, uh, I believe two or three or four sessions with them. But it's if it's something that needs more long-term then they're referred on and, and uh, other support programs kick in place, but it's, um, it's pretty comprehensive and uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased the more people are using it. Great, thank you. Uh, Monique? I don't know of any in Maine off the top of my head, but in um, some of that work, um, when we got that initial uh, grant in the ways that Christina found us, um, we started to work with um, the main chapter of NAMI, which is the National Alliance on mental health, uh, I can't remember the acronym, I feel really bad about that, um, to develop some peer-to-peer -peer programming that's been very successful for them and we think will be very successful for fishermen. Fishermen tend to be 
um, pretty introverted uh, people and um, not necessarily willing to share their feelings, but if they're talking with other fishermen in a casual way, they can be um, supportive in that capacity. So with NAMI, um, we do want to work on a peer-to-peer -peer program, which would be able to help with recovery and, and substance abuse. And I just want to reiterate, Ian said something that I, I just completely agree with. The mental health work that I'm doing um, with MCFA is um, under a program that I run called Safe at Sea. Safe at Sea offers um, life rafts and survival suits for fishermen on loan if they need to for one reason or another. Um, but we, we ended up putting mental health under that program because we recognize, just as Ian said, you know, you can't be distracted in the middle of the Gulf of Maine. Um, you're putting your life as well as your crew's life at risk, your safety. Um, you want to do a good job. So we really try to think about, you know, keeping our, our fishermen healthy on shore helps keep them safe at sea. And I, I think that's uh, incredibly important. Great, thanks. Okay, we're getting a few questions. Um, I, I do see the one about uh, families, but I'm just going to do this one first. Uh, what can, since we were just speaking about just before this, what can fishery managers do to better include fishermen in policy discussions to avoid them feeling like it's just a box to check? Do you want to tackle, start? I mean, I, I can start that. I, I, I um, in the working waterfront report that I that I mentioned at the the beginning of this, I actually have um, an an appendix that includes uh, how to interview fishermen, um, and I think that um, the managers, policymakers, regulators, scientists, and others. Um, could learn about communication and interview techniques and building relationships um, and understanding that fishing families, which I totally forgot to mention, I'm married to a fisherman, <laughs> um, fishing families, uh, you, you know, it, it's, we can be pretty contained and siloed um, and, and we don't mean to be, but um, it's a very relationship driven industry. And so working with the fishermen to have a conversation with the intention that there's gonna be a beginning and an end. And as the person that's doing the interviewing that you're gonna get all the information that you need and that's that is not realistic. And in, in my opinion is completely unfair. Fishermen love their jobs. They love talking about fishing. They love talking about their boats. They love talking about the ocean. If Working with fishermen is, is more than a one and done. It's building relationships, it's getting on boats, it's understanding the intricacies of being a fisherman and living that type of life um, that I think, you know, there, there could be a little bit more meeting, meeting halfway um, in that. And, and so what I was saying too about being a fishing family is, you know, even as fisheries managers and people that understand the fishing industry as, a fishing family, you're still going to be seen as an outsider until you start to build that relationship and trust. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a big part of it. So it's, it's really getting into the fishing communities, because um, right now, and probably same in Canada, the fishing community and fishing families is very siloed from the scientists, which is very siloed from the environmentalists, which is very siloed um, from the managers. And so we need to figure out how to com communicate better and, and build trust. Um, which is way easier said than done. <laughs> Great, thanks. Ian, did you wanna add anything to that? Uh, kind of two quick things that have uh, been, um, we've seen improvement in over the last few years, which I think have been beneficial. Uh, number one is sufficient advanced notice of meetings. <laughs> there was major me me meetings that would be bounced around and then all of a sudden you've got two days notice. Uh, most of our meetings are in the winter, so weather has to be impacted in, with that. And then the second thing is, and I think there again, our DFO is, is uh, catching the drift that if there's an, an agenda item on the meeting that requires more discussion, then the agenda has to allow for that and not just be, okay, we've reached our half hour. And it could be a very important meeting. So because when you have people getting up maybe four or five in the morning to be at a, a morning meeting off island, they want to be heard and, and not just a ticked off box and, oh, we don't have time to discuss that. So I, we've seen a really good improvement in that. Uh, there's still a ways to go. And, but at, at the end of the day, we are focusing on some of those items. Thank you. Um, 
do your um, organizations also help support families and the greater community? Uh, this is sort of building on a question because uh, obviously if it affects the Fisher then uh, it's also there'll there'll be repercussions. So can you speak about so you know services as well as sort of how you're helping trying to help or how families and communities could be helped as well? Sure, I, I don't mind. Um, so first of all, I want to say I also saw in the Q and A, I, I, Fishing Partnership Support Services in Massachusetts is an amazing program, and they do have some um, substance and recovery programs. So thank you to the people that uh, reminded me of that. I appreciate it. We'll add that um, to our uh, resource list. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so I, I mean, I can speak to this question specifically as a fishing family as well, and that is there is quite a bit of, of stress um, with being a fishing family this past. Um, January 2020, uh, January 23rd, 2020, um, one of the boats that we work with very closely, actually the, the chair of our board sank and the crew perished. And my husband was at sea when that happened. And I couldn't get a hold of him, of course, because there's not great service in, in the Gulf of Maine. And um, Joe was a, a friend. And so it was extremely extremely difficult um, and very hard and emotional. And um, our executive director, Ben Martens, brought on um, a grief counselor for our staff and the fishermen with whom we work or whoever needed it. And um, that is an incredibly important part of our organization is, is the families and, and not just the fishermen. And granted, I, I am friends with a lot of them. They are uh, fishermen when they call are always willing to tell you about how the kids are doing, how their dogs are doing, you know, when their next doctor appointment is. And so we try to celebrate our community quite a bit and have events during the summer that are geared specifically towards getting the whole family involved um, because that's important to us. You know, fishing families are a team. Um, and uh, there are quite a few events in Maine that, that celebrate that. And, and we definitely try to extend the resources that we have in the organization to family members if necessary. And there are a few programs in Maine. Um, there's one for uh, families that lost um, members of their family at sea and um, you know, so including family, it's sort of a given that I don't know what Ian would say, but it's when you get the fishermen, you get their family too, so. Ian, did you want to? Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if I made this clear, but our, our program uh, uh, is not just for captains, it's for their families also, or any family member. And so, and all their crew and, and any family members. So uh, the statistics, even though you could show uh, 10 people participating, participating in the program for that particular period, it could be many times that in terms of uh, extended family or, you know, uh, because families are, are spread wide. I, I, I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that many times crew, everybody comes from the same community. That's why it's so devastating if a boat goes down and, and, and people are lost. But on the other hand too, uh, I'm hoping that the reason our program is starting to be uh, a little more popular is word of mouth. And, and that to me would be the best endorsement that, I don't know that for sure, but we're starting to see some, some steady numbers come out of it. And I'm, I'm very pleased. Yeah, that's great. And maybe I'll keep you on. I, I was, um... Yeah, curious about sort of the if if you're seeing more um, people engaging with the program over time. And on that note too, um, just because we're getting close to the end here, just for um, other organizations that are currently working with fishing communities around the world, if you have any suggestions for them on how to build those relationships with uh, the fishermen so that maybe, or I guess trying to, what's some tips on approaching helping with the mental health side of things? Like what, what would you suggest for groups wanting to get into doing some of the same things that you are? That was a very rambly question, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. I, and you know, I mean, there's money involved. I mean, we match funding. We do get some government funding, which is much appreciated and was a, a great catalyst, but I think I won't speak on behalf of the board, but I think they've seen an, a lot of positive things from it and we would continue on regardless. Uh, I would say, I think the biggest thing is that if you're sitting down and doing a pilot project is to build as much flexibility into it as you can. Because um, 
it's great to treat part of an, uh, an issue, but uh, just like we found out with the crew, uh, we, here we thought we were doing a great thing for our members, but the crew are, are just as valuable. And, and so it's better to, to look at that, uh, make it accessible, uh, keep stressing the confidentiality of it. And then I, I think uh, that you only get aggregate numbers and, and, and keep uh, it out there. We put out pamphlets, but whenever we put out a newsletter, we put a little update about what's going on, remind people of the program. So these are all things that I think could give you a successful program and launch. Monique, thank yeah, you. I, mean, I think what exactly what Ian said. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, just a, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, that the fishermen are, are human beings. Sometimes they might be salty, cranky dudes, but uh, they, they're just like all of us. And so it's as simple sometimes as connecting with another human being and asking them what their needs are and what they want and remembering you know, the de we all suffer at some point of, from some form of depression or anxiety. I think we've all felt stress in 2020 and it, it doesn't have to be um, a mystery or a silver bullet. It can start with something as simple as a conversation that just says, how are you doing and, and how can I help you? And, and thinking about what you would want as um, for some support services and how you can possibly offer that to, to fishermen. Great, thank you. Okay, we're just about uh, near the end of our time here. We we often have um, other writers or people uh, online and we actually had a question about craft for Christina. So maybe we'll just have a really quick answer uh, on uh, the, somebody is wondering about how your background in science writing informed this piece that is narr narrative and personal profile driven. And I think, it was a difficult story because they're 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 difficult stories to hear, and you're having to ask people very personal to recount very personal stories, which are very painful. So maybe talk a little bit about your approach in this story. Yeah, um, that's a great question. That's a great writing question. Um, so uh, my background writing about science was tremendously helpful in a bunch of different ways. Um, number one, Brunswick is an area that's uh, been hit sort of extra hard by climate change. Um, it uh, climate change and uh, ocean warming is accelerating there at a much higher, a much faster rate than it is in other areas of the country. So the environment, like environmental studies, played a significant role in this particular story. And my background writing about science um, was really helpful for that. Uh, it was also really helpful in sifting through um, research on mental health and trying to figure out well what's the landscape? What do we know about this particular community? What type of research is, um, you know, can be extrapolated to this community? Um, who's studying it? Um, what kinds of questions are being answered? And then also looking at um, how the science is actually being done played a really big role in terms of talking about um, regulation and talking about um, that sort of slow stress, the fishermen face. Um, so having an idea of like how a scientific study is conducted was super, super helpful um, in terms of reporting it. These types of stories where um, science plays a role, but it's very like narrative driven around a person are sort of my favorite types of stories to write. Um, I absolutely try and scoop them up as much as possible. Um, so this kind of thing is not super uncommon for what I do. If that's, I don't know if that answers the question or not. I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so just be, as we wrap up, I just want to ask Monique and Ian if they have any last things they wish they would have, they want to make sure people know, people listening know. I, I just had one quick little thing. We kind of broached this about eight or nine years ago and there wasn't an appetite. And and when we we brought this program in mid 2019 and, and there was a whole bunch of support for it. So. I'm encouraged because I think from a societal standpoint, people are a lot more willing to talk about mental health and the importance of it and, and, and going to professional resources when they're, they're having challenges. So I would encourage anybody out there that's trying to uh, start a program or get one up and going is that it's well worth it. And uh, the benefits are probably immeasurable. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And I, I just wanted to, again, say thank you to Christina for, you know, covering this um, incredibly important topic and, and helping to shine some light on it. And 
you did a fantastic job with your interviews and questions. Um, you even I, I even after speaking with you a couple of times, I had to reflect on my own, own mental health and how much that working waterfront report probably, you know, uh, been talking with the fishermen and stuff. So I just I really appreciate it. Um, you did a fantastic job, and and thank you to the magazine as well. Thank you, and sincerely a thank you to every single fisherman who shared their stories. This was incredibly difficult to do the interviews on and the people who spoke with me, I'm really tremendously grateful to. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for, for the energy and difficulty um, that they went through to speak with me. Great. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing a question come in here. I think we kind of covered the other that and I think I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so I just thank you again for uh, participating in both the story and uh, in this panel. I think it's been really, really valuable. Um, if people are still typing in questions, we'll I'll try to get you some feedback if I can. Um, or just email us at the magazine um, and we'll we'll try to get you answers. Um, as I mentioned, we are putting at the bottom of the story, uh, so it, they'll be permanently there, the links to or these organizations, Ian and Monique's organization, but also others if you're wanting to reach out for whatever reason. And um, thank you everybody for participating, everybody who's, who's stayed with us. And uh, thank you, have a great day. <laughs>